I am going to tell you of someone who was, for many centuries, the second most famous historical character in the world. And, which is more, I can quite confidently state now that you have not heard of this person. All right, some of you have, but most of the people watching this video will not have heard of this person. So they were once tremendously famous, but then have sunk into obscurity. Perhaps, who knows, to be rescued from that obscurity by this very video, which has been sponsored by Wondrium. I have to state near the beginning of a video for legal reasons, uh, that it's uh, been sponsored. Anyway, uh, we'll get to the, uh, the, the one dream and all that later. So, how do we measure fame? So who was, you, let's just talk about this for a moment, who was the most famous person in the world ever? Well, uh, of course there's almost no way of proving this, but I would say that an extremely strong candidate for the most famous historical real person in the world ever is Queen Elizabeth II of England and Scotland and New Zealand and Canada and Gibraltar and Australia and an awful lot of other places. So why do I think that might be the case? Well, first, how widespread her fame was. Um, she was the head of the Commonwealth. That's a third of the world and it's a third of the world scattered all around the world. Hong Kong, for instance, she, people of Hong Kong would all have heard of her until Hong Kong uh, left in 1999, but until, and, until then, uh, the British were extremely... If you watch a Jackie Chan film, he's playing a, 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 a policeman, and you may notice that there's a picture of um, Her Majesty on the wall in the police office behind him, because he was in Hong Kong. Anyway, so her fame was extremely widespread, and not just the Commonwealth, but in all sorts of other countries, in the whole of Europe, in, in the USA, in the whole of educated, developed world. She was known, and she travelled around the world an awful lot, and so, yeah, her fame was very widespread. Also, um, she was at the top of her game. She was extremely famous for so very long. 70 years. That's a much, much longer career of fame than any film star or politician. Yeah, you might say, oh, surely the President of the United States is the most famous person in the world. Nah. The President gets, what, four years, eight years maybe, if things go very well, and then he what? He sinks into obscurity. He becomes the name of a local library and the answer to a few quiz questions. What's Obama doing now? Now, maybe you are a tremendous fan of Obama and are following his every tweet or something, and so you do know what Obama is up to now, but most people around the world have no idea. He was president and now he's... Well, is he still alive? Oh, apparently he still is. Um, whereas she was at the, the height of her fame for 70 years until the day she died. And which 70 years did she pick? Well, from the televisual age. She came to the throne in 1953, and that was the, what launched television in Britain. Um, uh, before 1953, uh, televisions were just for, for rich people and the like. But 1953, people heard, oh, they're going to televise the coronation. Oh, wow, that's never been done before. OK. Um, and by the time the coronation came around, every street, oh, yes, every street in Britain had televisions in it. Extraordinary. And then she was queen for the televisual age. And of course, television is a great way of, of throwing your fame out there. Um, and uh, the next part of my argument is that she was extremely famous in modern times when there were more people around in the world than ever before to have heard of you. So if you want to be um, tremendously famous and just measured in terms of just the number of people who have heard of you, well, yeah, obviously be famous now. Um, but I'm talking about historical people and how do you measure the fame of someone uh, not the Queen Elizabeth is not historical, but I mean, you know, in, in, in further back in, in, in past historical, how do you measure the fame of people who, who were, li lived many, many generations ago? Uh, you can't poll the population. Um, you can't take samples from viewing figures of, of media or anything like that. Well, I'm going to take this measure. It's the number of surviving artworks inspired by that person. That's a countable thing. So uh, how many... Uh, paintings, how many um, etchings, how many uh, dramas, how many poems, how many choral works, how many operas, how many tragedies, all those things, if they survive to the present day, they're a countable thing and they will show how famous somebody was in the past. I think that's a reasonable measure of fame. And so if you do that, who was the most famous person in the past? Well, it was Cleopatra VII of Egypt. You've probably heard of Cleopatra. In fact, if I just say Cleopatra, 
Um, immediately, you probably you're probably in your mind thinking, oh, Cleopatra. Oh, he must mean Cleopatra the seventh of Egypt, the Ptolemaic Greek queen. Ah, yeah. Or actually, more strictly strictly speaking, Pharaoh. But anyway, yeah. And she was tremendously famous. Um, uh, she lived between uh, what 63 and 30 BC, and she lived in a really exotic place. She lived in Egypt, and Egypt is just straight away cool, isn't it? You've got pyramids, you've got people walking like this, you've got hieroglyphs, you've got weird gods like Osiris and 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 Ra and Anubis. And don't tell me that Anubis isn't cool because Anubis is cool. Um, so you've got an exotic setting straight away. Uh, so that's good for for fame and. Sexy woman, okay, she, she was famously alluring and seductive. Well, that's great for fame because if you're a, if you're a, a painter and you want to sell paintings, and you, you, what, what 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 does your um, what does your patron want? Oh, a picture of a a sexy woman. Oh, okay, right. Uh, how about um, legitimizing this uh, desire uh, by by a painting of a an historical dramatic figure who was also just happened to be a, a sexy woman? And so okay, 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 right. I'll get on. I'll get on with that. Terrific. Okay. Um, so you can understand why that makes someone more likely to be famous. Uh, died young as well, which is another really uh, good thing for fame. Just, you know, look at Grace Kelly, uh, Lady Diana Spencer, Marilyn Monroe, or whatever. Dying young while you're still sexy, that seems to be pretty good for fame as well. So Cleopatra uh, did, did all that. And what a dramatic life Cleopatra had. Oh, yeah. I mean, she, you've, you've got fighting, you've got drama right from the off. She fought a civil war against her own brother. Uh, in order to do this, she allied one of the most famous and powerful men around, Julius Caesar of Rome. And what an introduction, rolling yourself up in a carpet and da 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 da. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's an entrance, right? There's drama and fame right there. That's something for the, the portrait painters to, to, to paint. And everyone will go, oh, woman wrapped up in a carpet, Egyptian setting, pyramids in the background. Oh, it's Cleopatra the Seventh. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, but more than that, you've got you've got treachery because she she um, uh, after uh, seducing uh, Julius Caesar, which by the way is a, is a reversal thing because Julius Caesar was absolutely infamous for seducing other men's wives. He seemed to get a particular uh, thrill uh, out of uh, humiliating them, uh, these cuckolds. Um, now boots on the other foot. She's seducing him. Aha! Well, you know that's another. Um, uh, fame-worthy thing, which uh, were likely to inspire artists. And after perhaps bearing him a son, she then jumps ship and, yes, she then um, shacks up with Mark Antony, uh, Julius's rival. That's right. She, you know, she seduces Richard Burton himself. And uh, and then you've got epic battles, one, one of the, the, the big battles right near the end, and it looks like Antony's going to win. Uh, but then she gets cold feet and she turns tail and precipitates a rout, which turns the battle into a disaster. And then Antony hears that Cleopatra has died, and then he, hearing this news, stabs himself because he was absolutely body and soul, it seems, in love with her. And what greater proof can you have by the fact that he stabbed himself on learning that she was dead? But she wasn't dead! He had, for a while, lived an amazing life with her. It seems one of, of orgies and, and drug taking and just general debauchery and hedonism. And, and that's that's pretty good for drama and, and, and inspiring poets and the like. Uh, anyway, uh, she then uh, heard that he had died and then she commits suicide with murder, killing herself slowly with a, with a poisonous asp. Oh, drama upon drama. It's like the ending of Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? Um, and uh, she then gets to die decorously. But you can imagine if you're uh, writing an opera, oh, that's brilliant because an asp doesn't kill you quickly and you can sing for quite some while about, you know, oh, if, uh, you know, how the poison of the asp is working its way into my veins, but oh, my love for this man and that man, and if only this and if only that, and oh, poor me, and oh, thud. You can get a really long aria out of that. So drama, 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 sexiness, great exotic setting. It's got everything. So yes, it's not perhaps that surprising that Cleopatra the seventh uh, of Egypt was the most famous person who ever lived in terms of the number of surviving artworks from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment periods and the like. Um, so, uh, by the way, um, uh, Cleopatra, this is something that comes up a number of times. I just wanted to um, I've heard a number of times people say quite stridently, Cleopatra was black. No, she wasn't. She was Ptolemaic Greek. She was uh, the 
descendant of, uh, of Ptolemy of Macedon, who uh, was one of the generals of Alexander the Great, who conquered his way uh, around the much of the known world. Uh, didn't go as far as Carthage, though, because Carthage was too, too powerful. Uh, ignored Rome, because pff, Rome was nothing in those days. But he conquered Egypt, and he set up Ptolemy, one of his generals, as... Um, uh, as, as the ruler of Egypt, and then um, in the Hellenistic period, which followed after the death of Alexander, uh, Ptolemy consolidated his kingdom, actually expanded it a bit, and founded a dynasty, and she was his great-great-great, can't, really can't remember how many greats, uh, granddaughter. Um, in fact, we have reason to believe that she was ginger. Uh, she's often pictured with red hair, and that's about as far from black as you can get. Um, and the ancient Egyptians, when they were picturing themselves, um, and, and picturing themselves sometimes alongside uh, sub-Saharan dark-skinned Africans were quite clear uh, to, to, to picture the distinction. Did you just look at these, these models here? Can you tell which are the Egyptians and which are the, the Nubians? Yeah, it's not difficult, is it? Um, uh, anyway, so, uh, no, well, she can't have been ginger, uh, because, you know, I've seen the, the pictures with the hieroglyphs and the, and the cartouches and everything, and she's got, the, she's got that sort of, you know, the big Egyptian, has to, yeah, they're called wigs. They're called, they're called wigs. They, they, they wore wigs. She got quite into the uh, Egyptian style. She was, as far as we know, uh, the first of the Ptolemaic uh, rulers to uh, become fluent in the Egyptian language. Uh, so she embraced the Egyptian culture, perhaps a, a bit more than the, a lot of uh, the other members of her dynasty, who were a bit more uh, Gracophile. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, so she wasn't really Egyptian. She, was, she definitely wasn't black. Um, and it's interesting, actually, on the, in the, um, the, uh, the Wandrium course uh, called Great, uh, what's it called, Famous Greeks, um, she's, she's listed as a Greek, which I don't think is unreasonable because she was of the Hellenistic culture. Uh, she spoke Greek. She was a descendant of Greeks. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, do, let's do the Wandrium thing now. So what is Wandrium? Well, my sponsor. Um, uh, and uh, one of the many courses uh, available on Wandering, which is a huge website that has loads and loads of academic courses on all sorts of topics, there's there's bound to be something that you'll be be, be interested in, uh, and one of them is uh, famous Greeks, and it uh, deals with some sort of legendary figures like Theseus, uh, for example, who I, I think is probably based on someone real, but is so mixed up in mythology that I, more of a legendary figure than a historical one. But the Theseus to very definitely historical figures like uh, Pericles. That's not Pericles, by the way, that's Pericles uh, of Athens. And then goes on to uh, Cleopatra, who you could argue was Egyptian, but she was, she was Macedonian. Um, and uh, oh, Alexander the Great is also listed as a Greek, which, which I, it's interesting because that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, he was Macedonian. Now, I can remember teasing uh, Greek uh, people before the, the Greeks adopted the as their uh, currency. They had the drachma and on the back of the drachma coin was the head of Alexander the Great. And they think, well, why, why have you got this Macedonian on your Greek coinage? Um, and I, I would tease because they would say, oh, no, 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 Alexander the Great was, was Greek. Um, well, yeah, well, he was I mean, he was highly his culture was highly Greek um, influenced. That's for certain. But you know, he was from Macedon, and the Macedonians conquered Greece. Um, if he was so Greek, uh, why did the, a massive confederation of Greek states come together and, and fight big battles against him? Like, uh, 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 what was it? Hang on, Cacronia, Cacronia. That's it. That would have been now oh, three hundred. 330 or 40 BC, something like that. Um, and so you've got the Athenians and the Megarans and the Corinthians and oh, loads of other people have all come together uh, to, to resist this outside invader. Um, but yeah, so he, he had to conquer Greece uh, and then he went on to the Egypt. And he's a Greek now, apparently. Uh, anyway, that was a bit of a... Oh, yes, yeah, so Wondrium. Um, so... Uh, um, yes, you, so loads and loads of uh, lecture courses on all sorts of uh, topics. And if you go to wondrium.com stroke Lindy Beige, there you will find uh, details of a free trial period offer. And you can wander around the site, have a look at all these amazing lectures uh, by lecturers from august proper universities, not just YouTubers mouthing off like me, but you know, people with professor in front of their name and stuff like that. Um, and people with really good cradle technique. Although I have to say this particular lecture series on famous Greeks isn't the strongest if, if, if cradle technique is, is uh, what you're after. Let's have a quick look. You see, he's gone, he's gone for sort of a lectern casual, I call this. So you've got one, one hand on the, on the one elbow on, on the lectern showing, it shows confidence, doesn't it? it what, what he's saying is that, um, yeah, my notes are there, but 
I don't need my notes. I'm above needing notes. I know my stuff. My notes are there. I can refer to them if necessary, but uh, I'm, I'm cool. I can get away with it. But of course, if you've got um, uh, an elbow up on the lectern, it does you know, cramp your style with the, for the cradle work a little bit. But um, anyway, uh, so there you go. So my sponsor, Wondrium. Um, now, um, if, uh, if we talk about the uh, the second most famous person you may notice that the second most famous person by the same measure the number of surviving artworks to this day is very similar to the first it's very similar to cleopatra in a lot of ways okay so that second person was are you braced sophonisba i'll be honest have you heard of sophonisba i mean some of you may be very good at self-deluding so by the end of this video you'll be saying oh yeah i knew i knew about her i knew i knew i knew uh, but in the in the years ahead you'll know because you've watched this video about sophonisba so if you're ever in an art gallery and you're walking along and you see a, an oil painting of a woman in flowing robes uh, looking as though she's a little bit uh, the worse for wear and she's got a letter in one hand and a cup in the other and there are some servants in the background going oh the horror and oh will the god save us and oh the despair um then you can remember i'll be soften isba yeah yeah i know these things um and everyone will be tremendously impressed with you and they'll probably invite you around to dinner or something uh okay so who was soften isba well um she started life sometimes she's described as being a princess which is pretty good if they make a disney movie of of her um she was the daughter of a very uh powerful and influential carthaginian general called Hasdrubal. Now, uh, you may think, oh, Hasdrubal, that's Hannibal's younger brother. Yes, Hasdrubal was Hannibal's younger brother. The trouble is that um, there were, how many, how many Carthaginian generals called Hasdrubal do you think there were? Eleven! Unless surely that's enough. Uh, they had eight Hannos. It's ridiculous. Um, anyway, um, this one is sometimes known as Hasdrubal Gizko or Gizgo. Unfortunately, Gizgo and Gizko are sometimes used interchangeably, but other times they're used to distinguish two different people, one called Gizgo and one called Gizko. It's very annoying. But anyway, he was a, um, a Carthaginian general who was commanding armies in Spain during the Second Punic War. And he had a, a beautiful daughter, Sophonisba. Uh, she's now called Sophonisba. That's become, uh, since the Renaissance period, consolidated uh, solidly as her standard name that everyone uses now. But actually, in ancient texts, she's often Sophoniba, Sophonisbe. Uh, we have reason to believe that her Punic name was Sapan Baal. Um, so anyway, Sophonisba is what I'm going to be calling her from now on. So he had a beautiful daughter. That's an asset. You can marry beautiful daughters off to secure alliances and the like. And this is what he did. And he had her betrothed to uh, Masinissa, who was the ruler of the eastern lot of Numidians, or rather, actually, his father was at that stage. But he was heir to um, the, the, the east of Numidia. Now, Numidia was a region of what is today North Africa, sort of Tunisia, Algeria, that sort of area. So these were a Berber-like people, and they were famous for extremely good mercenary light cavalry. And the Carthaginians employed many thousands of them in that role very, very successfully. Time and time again, the battle went uh, the Carthaginian way because the Numidians made the difference. So it was really worthwhile having um, many thousands of, of these light elite cavalrymen on your side. They were, they were decisive in battle. Uh, now, Masinissa changed sides uh, so did his rival, Syphax. Syphax uh, was a ruler of the Western uh, Numidians. And so there are many, many tribes. We can't, we don't know all the details, but there, in a, a big area of Africa like that, there are going to be lots of tribes, but they seem to be united culturally to some degree, and probably, I would imagine, linguistically. So there's probably a, a single language or, or family of languages um, spoken by the Numidians in that part of Africa. And both Syphax and Masinissa were very ambitious. Each of them would far rather have been king of all Numidia rather than just ruler of some of the Numidian tribes. And that ambition is part of what drives our story. So um, Masinissa, as I say, he was with the Eastern Numidians and he was betrothed to marry Sophonisba. And that was going to seal an alliance with the Carthaginians. Great. Thing is, though, that uh, the Senate, the Carthaginian Senate, so we are told, 
decided that it would be a much better match. Uh, use, they would use the pawn, the, the, the bargaining chip of Sophonisba, um, more wisely if they married her off instead to Syphax. And uh, this then, it seems, happened. So she married Syphax. We are told in some texts that Massinissa was genuinely in love with her and therefore really disgruntled that this happened. And that that is one of the reasons that uh, Massinissa then later sided with the Romans because of that, that disgruntlement over a woman. So that makes it very significant, if it's true. Anyway, so she was married to Syphax and we are told that Syphax fell very definitely in love with her as well. So we've got a very alluring, uh, beautiful, presumably therefore sexy, young princess stroke um, queen. When, once she married a king, she's sort of a queen. So we've got the royal thing as well in there. So you can see why the, the fame is building up now, why this is a good dramatic story. So she's also a pawn. Or is she a very active schemer? That's the thing. You can paint it either way. In some tellings of the story, she's the innocent pawn who forced to marry this man, whom she, perhaps she didn't love, and then this man, perhaps she didn't love, and then uh, she was at the mercy of another man, and, and, so, and, and so forth. So, and that's dramatic, okay? But also, the scheming woman who, who cleverly gets herself married to this man and then influences him to do this and then gets married to another man and when, when the, the, the things look more suitable uh, she j jumps ship again because she was clever, you see, and scheming is another way of, of painting the same picture. Helen of Troy is another of these characters. If you look at ancient, the, writers of, uh, the writings of ancient writers uh, writing about Helen of Troy, they see her as a blank canvas upon which they can paint pretty much whatever they like. Um, now you've got to remember that when uh, the, the, the people like Euripides and, and, and the like were writing stories of the Trojan War uh, in classical Athens, this was, uh, what, uh, eight centuries after if Helen existed at all. If Helen existed at all, she would have existed eight centuries before. So the too soon rule had, had lapsed. So they could pretty much write whatever they liked about her. So in some versions of, of the, the Helen of Troy story, uh, you know, she again is, is the innocent pawn uh, going from one man to the next and just, just swept along by the tide of, of history and war and the like, uh, and tragic as a result. Uh, but in others, she's, she's the schemer and the plotter. In some versions of the, the ancient tales, uh, she is madly in love with Paris and is absolutely uh, on the Trojan side in all matters. But in other versions, oh no, no, she's abducted by Paris against her will and she was always, still to the last, loyal to the Achaeans. So, which version of Helen do you want? Well, if you're writing a drama, you can just choose whatever suits your drama and, and write in that. Well, Sophonisba seems to be another of these characters. Was she the innocent? Was she schema? You could even, of course, create your, your tragedy, making it ambiguous as to whether she's the innocent or the schema. Um, and that makes your tragedy all the more interesting, doesn't it? Um, a bit of greyness in a character makes them more intriguing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so... Uh, she sank into obscurity in the in the ancient period, and then uh, it was in the medieval period. One of the earliest uh, major works I found about her is by Giovanni uh, Boccaccio, and that's from 1361, and that's very definitely a medieval date. And when uh, she she gets revived in history. Um, it seems that uh, a lot of people were, were stressing that her female fortitude, she was an example of a woman who had to go through an awful lot of, of, of difficulties but, but struggled and was brave and the like, an example to us all in that sense. The ancient writers are more ambiguous, some of them, again, the innocent pawn, the scheming witch, um, but it's said over and over by ancient writers that she was extremely good at getting men's loyalty and bending them to her will and getting them to fall in love with her. And that's a really powerful power to have. And given that she was influencing kings who were then changing sides in a very important and decisive war that ended up changing which way the, the war in fact went, that makes her a very significant figure. She was actually pivotal. She was, you probably heard of the, the, the story of uh, 
you know, for want of a nail, the shoe was lost, for want of the, the shoe, the horse was lost, blah, 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 down to the battle is lost, the war is lost, and all for want of a nail. Well, she's a bit like that. You can trace uh, the defeat of Carthage down to whether someone loved Sophonisba or not. Um, now, um, uh, later on, she becomes uh, loads of uh, English restoration dramas uh, written by her. There's one in uh, 1676 by Nathaniel Lee. Uh, choral works, Henry Purcell wrote one in 1685, and I found a list online of uh, 20 other major choral works. That wasn't exhaustive, like, there were just 20 examples of major choral works written about Sophonisba over the span of the centuries. Uh, the height of her fame was the 16th to 18th centuries, uh, but also uh, her fame continued into the 19th century, definitely, and a little bit into the 20th, and then she seems to have just faded uh, from view. Possibly, I suspect, because in a lot of ways she's just a little bit too similar to Cleopatra. Uh, because Cleopatra, if you remember, uh, goes from uh, Julius Caesar to Mark Antony. Well, Sophonisba goes from uh, Syphax to Massinissa. Um, and uh, for similar sort of reasons. So it's actually quite a similar tale. And she ends up killing herself with poison, much like Cleopatra. And she was an, in, in, a North African queen like Cleopatra. And yeah, so possibly that's why. There was just too much similarity with Cleopatra. And so the more famous one won out. OK, uh, we could make a film about Sophonisba or Cleopatra. Cleopatra is more famous, more money in it. We'll do, we'll do Cleopatra. Maybe that's how it happened. Anyway. Um, so, uh, ancient uh, historians like Appian, for instance, tell us uh, that Syphax was genuinely in love with her and that Masinista was genuinely in love with her and that uh, because he had had his fiancée snatched from him and married forcibly by the Carthaginian state, Masinissa was furious with the Carthaginians and went, right, I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump ship, I'm going to join the flipping Romans, you see if I don't. And if that's true, then that's very, very significant because the Battle of Zama was what eventually decided the Second Punic War and the Battle of Zama was a very close run thing. Hannibal led his army so brilliantly that he very nearly won. He very nearly inflicted on Scipio, later Scipio Africanus, his only defeat. Um, and what settled it, that the two lines of infantry clashed and were fighting away on the plains of Zama and the cavalry had galloped off into the distance. And who were the cavalry? Well, the significant cavalry was Syphax um, on one side, uh, the Carthaginian side, and Massinissa on the other. So. This had become a fight not just between Rome and Carthage to decide uh, who wins the Second Punic War, but also it became the decisive battle which decided who became king of all Numidia. So it was an astute move by uh, Scipio, perhaps, to put his Numidians on the same flank um, as uh, the Carthaginians' uh, band of, of, of um, Numidians, because he knew that his guys were going to fight really keenly, knowing that if they won, their guy would become king of the whole lot. And the, the, the cavalry galloped off into the far distance and the, the infantry, the Romans and Carthaginians, carried on fighting pretty much to a standstill, could have gone either way. And from the far distance, which victorious side rode out of the dust and then fell onto the back of which, yeah, it was the Carthaginians. They fell onto the back of the Carthaginians. It was Massinissa. He had won. Um, and so that turned the tide of the Battle of Zama, and that led to Hannibal's ultimate defeat, Scipio's ultimate victory, and Rome's ultimate victory over Carthage, and that settled who was the most powerful state in the whole of the Mediterranean for the next many centuries. The answer was Rome. And all because, perhaps, one man loved one woman. So, drama, eh? There's drama for you. So that's why she was quite so very famous. Now, um, why did... Uh, why did the ancients think that she was so clever? Well, because she had an effect on men and she was clearly in, uh, doing something behind the scenes diplomatically and having an effect. So, yeah, fair enough, call her clever. And they also thought that she was very sexy and alluring, and that was their way of explaining how she was able to do this. Um, she was, it seems, pretty much loyal for her entire life to the Carthaginian cause. So every time uh, she was 
put with a different king, she persuaded him to go over to the Carthaginian side. So Syphax was, at one point, on the Roman side. Um, Scipio's father, uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio, that is to say, he, Scipio, who later became Scipio Africanus, was Publius Cornelius Scipio. His father was Publius Cornelius Scipio. Honestly, some people. But anyway, Publius Cornelius Scipio the Elder and his brother, so that's Scipio's uncle, uh, uh, Gna Gna Gnaeus, they were the commanders of the Roman armies in Spain during the Second Punic War. And they persuaded Syphax to change sides and come over to the Romans. Meanwhile, Massinissa was still fighting for the Carthaginians. And Massinissa, let us remember, was betrothed to Sophonisba. So it's all part of the equation. And uh, an important detail, which I'll come back to later, is that it was Massinissa's men in, uh, uh, in battle who killed both Publius Cornelius Scipio the Elder and his brother Gnaeus. So, in other words, that's the father and the uncle of Scipio Africanus. Remember that. Now, uh, there was a battle. There were, there, Scipio invaded uh, North Africa towards the end of the Second Punic War in order to uh, fight the Carthaginians on their home turf and maybe bring the war to an end that way. Hannibal had been fighting in Italy for absolutely ages and the Romans had just been unable to defeat him there. But maybe they could take the war to Africa and maybe this would draw Hannibal out of Italy, freeing Italy from the, the, the menace of him. And then the, a decisive battle, which turned out to be his armour, could be fought in Africa. And this did actually happen. So... Um, uh, Scipio fought some battles against the Carthaginians and won. And this is one of the reasons that the Carthaginian Senate started to panic and recalled Hannibal, because Scipio was, was running around North Africa winning battle after battle. And uh, shortly after, a couple of major uh, defeats for the Carthaginians was the Battle of Cirta. And at the Battle of Cirta, Syphax, uh, things were going quite uh, badly for him. A lot of his cavalry was, was caught and in a bad way. He had to, he, and he took a risk. He galloped bravely on his own, so we're told, uh, to, to rally those uh, cavalry and sort things out and maybe rescue the situation. But, alas, fate struck him. His horse stumbled and threw him. And gleefully, Massinissa's men were able to pounce and grab him. He was then a captive of the Numidian ruler uh, of the East Numidians, Massinissa. But Massinissa knew that he had a very useful pawn. He didn't have him killed straight away. He didn't kill his rival. He thought, OK, I can use this guy. Uh, for one thing, I can use him to impress the Romans. Oh, look who I've got. It's that guy who used to be on your side, but who jumped ship. And why did, she jump sh why did he jump ship? Well, because of Sophonisba. We are taught in, in um, a lot of modern writers make a great play of the fact that Polybius never names Sophonisba. Uh, he, he refers to her as the child bride of Syphax. And that, that seems quite belittling, doesn't it? Um, but I, I, I have a couple of things to point out about that. One, we don't have um, a, a complete version of Polybius. We just have, from that part of the story, we just have little fragments of um, Polybius. So I think it's quite likely that he'd mentioned, introduced Sophonisba uh, and by name properly earlier and was just referring uh, back to the earlier introduction with a bit with the fragment that we have, calling her Syphax's child bride. Um, and the other thing is that from the two surviving references to Sophonisba we have from Polybius, the first is very dismissive. In the first, uh, he, he talks about how Scipio was going to Syphax, and as he was going there, he, he thought, well, I don't have to worry too much about Sophonisba because they, they're very fickle, these Numidians, uh, and uh, he, he will have had his fun with Sophonisba, you know, this place. He will have tired of her already. Um, yeah, she's insignificant. Okay, the second time, he mentions her. He mentions her very definitely as instrumental in persuading Syphax to side with the Carthaginians. So is she insignificant or extremely significant? Um, the, the, the two mentions in Polybius uh, you know, are, are somewhat at, at odds there. Uh, interpret as you will. Anyway, um, because she had persuaded uh, Syphax to change sides, uh, that made her a traitor not just to uh, the Carthag not just to to Rome, but also uh, you know to 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 Numidia. You could argue, if from looking at it from Massinissa's point of view, um, 
and uh, it made her very, very tempting captive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Romans will love that. But wait, Scipio is the overall commander of the campaign and uh, he was claiming all the good stuff. So Massinissa thought, I better get to Syphax's palace pretty quick so I can get some of the good loot for myself. Otherwise, Scipio is going to turn up and get all the best stuff. So he rushed to his rival's palace and there met Sophonisba. And in the version of the tale as told by Livy, he met her for the first time. So, hang on, he was betrothed to her? Okay, you could be betrothed to someone in, in their absence, I suppose, considering the technology of the day and how people were political pawns and so forth. But was he really desperately in love with her? In love with someone he'd never even met? That doesn't seem to, to match. But then Livy doesn't say that he had been in love with her before. That's from other ancient writers. So Livy's version does clash, but Livy's, unfortunately, is, is the most complete uh, that we have of, of this meeting. So. He goes into Syphax's palace, uh, his rival having been captured at the Battle of Cirta, um, and uh, she throws herself at his knees and entreats him and is so alluring and so persuasive and so just all round generally wow, it seems, that he is smitten on the spot and agrees to marry her. Uh, in, Lee, in Livy's version, everything happens incredibly quickly. He goes from meeting her for the first time to marrying her to uh, effectively killing her in the space of, I don't know, it seems like 20 minutes. It happens in a couple of pages. It doesn't actually say, uh, it doesn't describe in any detail the time um, period over which this happens, but it certainly comes across as it's happening ever so quickly. It all seems like, like one scene of a play. Um, uh, I suspect all that's nonsense and that these things played out over a period of at least weeks. Anyway, whether it's Lizzie, Livy's version or someone else's, it is the case that Massinissa marries Sophonisba. Then Scipio turns up and Scipio says, uh, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? Uh, you've married her? Oh, yeah, Massinissa. I, I understood. Uh, she was forced, do you understand, forced by uh, the Carthaginian Senate, your enemies, against her will, <laughs> aren't they bad, uh, to marry Syphax, uh, but I have forgiven her. Um, out of the goodness of my heart and she's I've, I've met her I've talked to her she's just ace um, uh, it's all fine now everything's fine wait 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 says Scipio no 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 Scipio is already thinking ahead to the triumph in Rome and he wants to parade this captive in front of uh, the cheering crowds of Rome because you know that's going to be wonderful for his triumph and uh, he says no 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 she's Roman property now you're, you're fighting as an ally of Rome. Rome is in command of this campaign and we have defeated this enemy. And so everything that he owns belongs to us now, including his wife. Hand her over. But Massinissa says, no, <clears throat> yeah, she was his wife. I'm with you there, but she's now my wife and I am your ally and a very valuable ally as well. I've just helped you win some battles and I captured the guy. And, and anyway, I've married her now. It's, it's a fait accompli. I'm sorry, you've missed the boat. It's done. And uh, Scipio says, nope, sorry, not accepting that argument. Um, hand her over. Pretty difficult situation for Massinissa. I think you'll agree. Um, now, uh, I said that in those paintings, uh, she's got a letter in one hand and a cup in the other, and she's going, ah. Right, that's because in the usual version of the, of the story, um, the, the, right, the, the cup is, is simple, it, that's poison that she's drunk, well, that's why she's dying. The letter. In some versions, uh, it's the letter written to her by Massinissa saying, Dear Sophonisba, hope you are well. Um, terribly sorry to report that uh, I've been in negotiations with General Scipio and he thinks it's best if you get paraded in triumph in Rome. Uh, I appreciate that's probably not what you want. Uh, and uh, normally I would, of course, protect you from such a fate. However, um, the Romans are terribly powerful. I do really want to be king. Um, so uh, I, out of fear of the Romans and my own personal ambition, which I hope you can understand, um, I've decided that, yeah, I, may, maybe, uh, I, maybe you should be handed over to the Romans and, and be paraded in triumph. Ah, but, but, that's the bad news, but, but, on the other hand, I have good news as well, because you'll find, with this letter, a cup of, um, some poison that I've sent with you, which you can mix up in a cup, and, and then, then take a, a really, a really heroic, 
uh, and a true Carthaginian princess's way out of the situation that I'm offering you out of the generosity of my heart. You can see how I'm, I'm meaning well here. Um, uh, so to, uh, anyway, uh, so that's how it is. Uh, sorry it's come to this. Um, uh, your, your, your loving husband, Massinissa. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Brackets. Sorry. So that's one version of the story. Uh, another one is that the letter is actually one that she has written to Massinissa, uh, in which she writes out essentially the, the, the words of her dying aria um, along the lines of, oh, thank you, dear loving husband, and uh, I, I, I could not uh, ever give the satisfaction to my enemies of being paraded in, in Rome in front of the cheering masses, and, and so I have ch decided to take, like a true Carthaginian princess, the noble way out, and I have mixed a cup of poison, and blah, 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 it's a far, far better thing that I do, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. your loving wife softened this but boom. So it's a suicide note, essentially. So letter, cup, dead. Soften this but. Um, uh, so, what a dramatic end! So you can imagine if you're an aria writer, oh, brilliant, I get to write loads of stuff. And in some versions, uh, Massinissa, he, he himself takes the cup, there's no letter, he takes the cup of poison to her. Uh, certainly in Livy's version, it seems that she's just in the next room. Um, and uh, so no letter is necessary. Uh, and exactly how does she kill herself? Does she kill herself as an act of defiance? Does she kill herself as an act of self-pity? Does she kill herself out of terror of the Romans? Um, does she kill, kill herself as a calculated act of revenge and loyalty to Carthage? You can, you can, you can, you can paint. Isn't that wonderful? It's a scene. It's a blank canvas. It's a great inspiration for artists. So uh, you know, th that's why so many songs and poems and the like have been written about her because there's so much material for drama. Um, now, I, I do wonder what would have happened if she had been taken to Rome as a captive, because in the triumph that followed a, a victory that was, that was granted to a Roman, victorious generals were sometimes granted by Rome a triumph, which was a big sort of victory festival, and he would uh, wear a gold cape and ride around on a chariot through town and parade captives and so forth. And these captives were sometimes executed in front of cheering crowds in the forum. This happened to a number of captives we know. It didn't seem to happen to Syphax, though. It didn't always happen. So possibly she would have been taken to Rome, which would have been a humiliation, but not killed. And she could have then lived out the rest of her life in Rome or nearby, perhaps as a captive, as a, no longer as a queen, but you know, maybe someone would have taken pity on her. Who knows what would have happened to her? So she wouldn't necessarily have died. Syphax did get captured, did get taken to Rome, but he wasn't executed in the forum in front of a cheering crowd. Instead, he died about a year later in Tiber, which is today Tivoli, which is a town not very far from Rome. Um, he was definitely a captive when he died, but we don't know exactly what he died of. Uh, it just could be the, you know, scratched himself on the thorn, got an infection, died. You know, there are a thousand things that could kill you. There's no evidence that he was actually executed. So what exactly her fate would have been, I can't tell you. Uh, uncertain, but humiliating, definitely. She would have been in that triumphal parade, uh, shown as a, a de defeated captive, and someone who had worked schemingly against the interests of Rome by getting not one, but two kings of the Numidia to change sides. Ooh, ooh, what a rotter. So you can imagine her fate probably wouldn't have been good. She wouldn't have been great marriage material for any patrician. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> Other versions of the story, for instance, Diodorus has Syphax warn Scipio about what a scheming witch this uh, Sophonisba is, and warn Scipio that she might persuade Massinissa to change sides. So that is a reason uh, that is often cited by modern historians why Scipio did what he did. It was to stop um, uh, Sophonisba working her magic yet again and getting Massinissa to change sides again back to the Carthaginians, which he definitely wouldn't have happened. Don't forget that this meeting, by the way, uh, after the Battle of Sirta, capture of Syphax, etc., was before Zama. So this is actually the, the war still going on. It's still hanging in the balance here. So Scipio doesn't know that he's won. So yeah, um, keeping Massinissa on side is still very, very important. Uh, so that's a, a, an obvious reason that it's, it's, it's in all the books. Um, uh, another reason is, um, according to Plutarch, uh, we are told, 
Annoyingly, Plutarch's um, biography of Scipio doesn't actually survive, but loads of references in other works to it survive. And it seems that according to Plutarch, um, Scipio was uh, worried that Masinissa might wreak awful vengeance against Sophonisba. So he was, he was saying hand over Sophonisba in order to protect Sophonisba, a very noble motive. And why might he? Well, because Sophonisba had jumped ship and gone over to Syphax you see, and betrayed um, Masinissa, and, and she had been betrothed to him before, and, and you know, so out of vengeance, um, Masinissa maybe, perhaps, had uh, wanted to harm uh, Sophonisba. There's no other evidence for that. That one's definitely contrary to other tellings of the tale, but there's a possibility. There is, however, one more reason which I find odd in that it's in none of the books. I haven't come across any ancient text or any modern text uh, that cites this as a reason uh, for why uh, Scipio did what he did. Uh, but in the book that I've uh, just uh, I've finished writing and which is being illustrated as a graphic novel by Chris Steininger, In Search of Hannibal, uh, I, I put this in, I allude to this because I think this is like an elephant in the room uh, idea. Remember earlier I said that Masinissa's men had killed Scipio's father and uncle, his beloved uncle it seems? Revenge. Is that not motive enough? Okay, so you want vengeance against Masinissa, but you can't take vengeance against Masinissa. Not directly, because Masinissa is now an extremely important military ally. But he's got a wife, and he loves that wife, and she is Carthaginian. So, oh yeah, he can say, give me her, I will take her, and I will perhaps execute her or just humiliate her in a triumph in Rome and keep her captive away from you. I will take your wife from you. I can do that, sunshine, and then send her away forever. Vengeance, is that not a good motive? Now, conceivably, I can't believe I'm the only person to have thought of that as a motive. Um, uh, but as I say, it's none of the hist ancient histories, and I, th I think I've read pretty much everything on, in, from the ancient histories on Sophonisba now, and um, I haven't come across it in any modern books about the history. However, there are an awful lot of tragedies and, and poems and the like about her, and I think it's pretty likely that one of those poets read the same history as me and thought, oh yeah, vengeance, that's why Scipio did it, because it was his one way he could hit Masinissa and get a personal revenge uh, uh, for his his father and beloved uncle without actually necessarily losing Rome, this vital ally. Anyway, that's an, I, an idea of mine. I, I suspect I can't be the first uh, to have thought of it. So now you know the story of Sophonisba. Started as a sort of princess, became a queen more than once, uh, was a powerful love for this man, powerful love for that man, uh, changing the tide of war and uh, clashing with Rome and the, the greatest men of the generation, such as Scipio Africanus, who's sort of the equivalent of the Julius Caesar of his day. Um, and so, yeah, what a story! It is a bit similar to Cleopatra's, though. Did the 